And it's, it's good that Nick's come in and agreed to uh, chat to us about uh, his story as a founder and um, what, what's going to happen next with, with Trumpet. So over to you, Nick. Cool. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I think I'll just give you a quick potted history of, of who I am. Um, so, so, yeah, I started life in corporate. Uh, so I worked at L'Oreal for four years doing marketing and brands, um, worked my way up to marketing manager there um, and then realized that uh, corporate, the top of the corporate ladder wasn't for me. Um, I sort of, you know, love getting my hands dirty and obviously the higher you go in corporate, the less you actually do. Uh, so at that same time, luckily, uh, my best mate from uni, Andrew, and I started plotting on sort of maybe what we could do together as a startup. This was back in 2010, um, where obviously the whole founder world and entrepreneurial world was very, very different back then. Um, we came up with the idea for Design My Night, uh, which some of you may have used, hopefully. Um, the first iteration of that was actually going to be a sort of... a a drinks discount site, believe it or not, uh, for London. Um, but luckily, I had a good friend that worked at Diageo. And I spoke to her and I said, look, if we had a really big site that was promoting drinks deals in London, would you advertise? And she said, absolutely not. She was like, no drinks brand would advertise on a site that offers discount drinks. So we sort of had to pivot before we even started. Um, and we sort of came up with the idea of launching it as a price comparison site for going out in London. So at that time, the compare the market and the meerkats and all of those, the go compare and the opera singer, all of those websites were launching. So we thought, okay, well, let's do a price comparison site for going out. So you could find cheap drinks, but you could also find uh, expensive cocktail bars, etc. cetera. Um, so we launched that. We did a, a year working um in our current roles while launching design my night um so we we met every weekend we met evenings um andrew worked at accenture at that time uh we put it live at the back end of 2010 um and i quit my job andrew stayed at his job and we shared his salary um he had a much bigger salary than i did at accenture uh so we shared his salary for about six seven months um, and then he came full time as well. Um, and yeah, we, we didn't know really what we were doing, to be honest, but we were just getting traction with the site. SEO, if anyone wants to dig into that, was very big for us. So back, it, back in 2010, 2011, content marketing SEO was very big for us. And obviously now it's a big thing and you hire content marketeers, um, but it wasn't really a thing back then. So we just uh, taught ourselves SEO um, and worked really hard on that, built up the site. Um, we raised £250,000 from six angels about a year and a half in. Um, and then the following year, they put another two hundred and fifty grand in. That's all we ever raised. So we only ever raised half a million pounds. Um, and about two years in, we pivoted to software. So it was actually one of our bar partners who said to us, you guys should build a bar booking software. Like we use OpenTable and restaurant booking software, but they never work um, for bars because bars are very, very different and operate very different to restaurants. So fortunately we listened to her and we took that idea away, spoke to lots of other people in the industry and it seemed like there was a need for that. Um, so we went away, built our reservation software in-house. At the same time for our sins, we built a ticketing software because we thought, okay, we've got all of these people coming to design my night, uh, seeing where to go out but then we were linking out to like Eventbrite and Ticketmaster and all of those. So we're like, well, we've got the traffic. We might as well sell our own tickets as well. So exactly the same time we had two workflows going, we built the reservation platform and the ticketing software. Um, launched that around 2013. Uh, luckily it was very successful. <clears throat> so we pretty much launched into most of the bars in the UK. Uh, when they saw it, they were like, yes, this is, exactly what we need uh, is built just for us um, we then went into the pub game so obviously that's great in the UK there's over like 100,000 pubs um, and pubs are interesting because they're sort of a bar and a restaurant and a private hire space so they're a very complicated beast um, and our software was very flexible so we then spread into bar chains as well 
um, <coughs> and yeah, grew it, grew the team. So we ended up with about a hundred people. Um, we exited the business in 2017. When we exited, we were getting 8 million views a month on Design My Night. Um, at one point, one in six Londoners were using Design My Night every month. Um, we were in 22 cities in the UK. Um, we had about 15,000 SaaS customers across our booking software and our ticketing software. Um, and yeah, we sold it to a, a UK uh, software house called Access Group, who are actually a, a unicorn, a very unsexy unicorn in the UK. Um, and they paid between 30 to $40 million for, for Design My Night. We had a, a two year earn out. So we had to stay there for two years um, with Target, which I can dig on if anyone wants to know about, about that. And we fully exited uh, Jan 2020. So just before COVID hit, uh, so perfect timing for managing a hospitality business. Uh, a lot of my friends joke, they think I started COVID just because I enjoyed not having to manage design my night during COVID, uh, um, but I didn't. So um, yeah, fully exited. The plan was to then just go and chill out and travel and stuff, but obviously we were all locked in our homes. So um, we got formulating ideas again um and uh we've uh, launched recently a new company called trumpet uh, which is in the the sales space sales operations space um which is very exciting um we've got three thousand people on the wait list we've opened up the beta earlier this year um and we've been work uh, that's been live for about four or five months we've got a thousand users on that platform uh we raised 1.6 million in, uh, in June. Um, that was pre-revenue, pre-product. Um, so yeah, all, all, all the signs are exciting there. Uh, I'm also an angel investor, so I invest in 57 startups across the world, um, which is great. Uh, so I uh, get to meet loads of cool founders, see some very interesting decks. Um, I've sort of backed off a bit now. I think every angel has a, their own cycle. Um, so I'm investing a lot less now and I'm seeing where these sort of 57 land um, and seeing if uh, any of them are hugely successful, which I hope they will be. Um, and I also do a podcast called Pitch Deck, if anyone's interested in that. So that's almost like a Dragon's Den style podcast where founders come and pitch myself and an angel investor and um, we do sort of like a live Q&A session. Um, so a more realistic Dragon's Den, let's um, and it's just really interesting to hear how different founders pitch their business, audio only as well, uh, so they don't have a deck or anything to go through, um, and just to see how early stage investors question a pitch, what questions they ask, what they like, what they don't like. So we're into series five of that now. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my history. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. I've got a question. Um, which three of the 57 do you think are most likely to blow up if you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, which one? It's, there, there's one, I've got, there's quite a few that are doing very, very well. Um, one that's easy to explain that you can all uh, have a look at as well. It's called Honest Mobile. Um, so it's a, a new telco company and they try to sort of apply the a monzo element and um a sort of octopus energy slash bulb before bulb went bankrupt um idea to telco so they're the first carbon negative telecoms business but they're also very tech forward so everything's in an app um you get a reply uh within seconds um if you are asked them for help they give you a loyalty bonus. So the longer you stay, the cheaper it gets rather than locking you into contracts like all the others. So they're just trying to add a, like a fresh take on, on telecoms, because I think if you ask 90 percent of people if they're happy with their mobile phone provider, they probably say no. Um, so, yeah, they're doing some really great things with eSIMs and free roaming. Um, and basically, they want to also be like the first mobile network that you can have globally. Uh, at free cost um, so very exciting it's a big vision um, but yeah check them out they're good thank you very much uh, Nick any any additional questions 
uh, for Nick at this point? Uh, we've got we've got one from uh, Alex. Is do you get involved and support all the fifty seven of your investments or just part of them? So virtually, what is your involvement with them? Uh, it's really up to the founders. Um, so probably out of the fifty seven. <clears throat> probably 15 uh message me quite actively which i encourage um and then the others you get your sort of monthly or quarterly update um and i'll have a dig and see what they're up to and if they've got any asks then then i'll, I'll do what i can to help i think it's one of the biggest failings of most founders is once you've raised investment is then just to go quiet like if you've got investors whether it's vc or angels like they're there on your team um, so give them updates regularly. Um, I think monthly is what we do with Trumpet. Ask for help. Um, they can't take their money away. So once they've invested, they want you to succeed. So be honest. Um, so yeah, it does irk me for some of the investments that I don't hear from them for six months, because uh, I just think it's an absolute waste of resources that you've got around you. So I do encourage anyone to um, really engage with, with investors if you have them at this stage. Thanks, Nick. We got some great questions in the uh, chat. Uh, one from Daniel. When was it clear that Design by Night, My Night was working? And what kept you going before that point? Um, it's funny you said Design by Night. So many people call it Design by Night, which was my biggest bugbear. Was a Freudian, <laughs> Freudian slip there, Nick. Everyone Freudian. used to call it. I was like, Design by Night doesn't even make sense. Uh, um, but everyone called it Design by Night. Um, terrible name, actually, because we actually then went into daytime brunch and brunch per So, yeah, I hate the name Design by Night, but that's by the by. Um, I think we I think we got inklings after maybe a year that the traffic was growing pretty steadily. Uh, we were getting really good feedback. We within that year, we did a mini pivot where we actually overnight just added make an inquiry buttons to everyone's pages on the website. We didn't ask the venues. Um, and then what Andrew and I did, we, we were like a concierge service. So where people made inquiries on our website, it came into Andrew and I, and we would work round the clock booking these people into the bars. So we would phone up the bars. Um, we would um, then text our users back, like, don't worry, we're working on it, etc. Because there was a big thing back in the day before our reservations platform that if you tried to book in a bar, you would phone them. And there's no one there in a bar until like five o'clock. And when you do phone them, it's someone shoveling ice while trying to book you in and they're not really listening. Or you fill out a form on their website and no one got back to you. So we were like, OK, well, if we can look after the users and we have a contact in each bar that we can get in contact with quickly. Um, so we did a very manual seven days a week booking people into venues but that was getting great feedback uh, people were talking about it um, so we saw a little bit of a viral aspect there it was also great for building relationships with our bar partners because we would phone them up some of them had never heard of us but they were just on our site and we would be like hi it's Nick from Design My Night you're on our site um, you're not paying us and that's fine but by the way I've got a booking of 10 for you do you want to take it and then suddenly, once you're phoning them up and giving them bookings of 10, three times in a row, they're like, oh, OK, well, who are these people? So we made a lot of relationships with bars that way as well. So it was a good way to grow. Um, so, yeah, that's when we started seeing traction. Interestingly, we were very lucky. We happened upon software. I think without the software, we wouldn't have lasted um, because just having like a media business where you make money from bookings or you or venues pay you for advertising just isn't a big business it's not scalable enough um so i i do feel design my night wouldn't have lasted if we didn't pivot to software um so that was a big move for us um how do we keep going i think we had just a a a, a, a pig-headed stubbornness that we were like this is going to work i think the noises were all pretty positive um and we were like, there, there is something here, like the bar market in the UK is a mess. Um, so there is something we can do here. So I think we just held that firm in our mind. There wasn't really anyone else focusing on the bar market like we were either at that time. Um, so yeah, 
but no, it's important as a founder that maybe if you're two years in and it's still not working, you need to have a chat with yourself. Like it's that balance of this is going to work and I'm going to do everything I can to make it work versus I'm just going to carry on regardless. You know, sometimes it is good to have some self-awareness and be like, look, maybe this isn't going to be the one that's going to work. It's time to move on. So it's sort of like a fine balance. Thanks, Nick. Um, great question from Nadia. Um, were there any times during uh, Design My Night when you thought it wasn't going to make it and what happened to turn that around? I know Nadia very well. She was very senior at one of our big competitors, Book at Table. Um, so I think before we launched the software, it was it was in, in, in balance. And actually, before, before that second round of funding came in, that 250,000, um, we were down to like eight grand, I think, at our lowest point. Um, so it was really squeaky bum time for us. Uh, and we really had to convince the angels to, to, to go again. Um, and we, we had the idea of software at that time, but we hadn't built anything. So I remember us like waiting for the call from like three of them to say they were in again. Um, and I think if they wouldn't have, we, we wouldn't have carried on. Um, so for us, it was, and I know Nadia is probably sick of me talking about software, uh, that, that pivot to software. Um, and as soon as we launched that software, it, it just clicked. And then we were like, okay, we're onto something here. Uh, bars were loving it. You've got recurring revenue every month. Um, and then the, the beauty of a, a SaaS business, a B2B SaaS business, is if you've got a product that people want, it's not rocket science. You then just need to add salespeople and customer success people. And if you hire a salesperson, they should bring in five times their salary as revenue. And if they are, you just add another one and then another one. Um, and then you keep adding customer success on the other side. Um, so if you have a product that people want uh, a SaaS business uh, is the easiest to scale i say easiest but easier to scale and thanks nick um question from gareth hawkins uh tell us about your thesis nick what have you particularly looked for in the startups you've invested in um pretty broad so so um you can go to our, our site is, is horseplay.ventures, which is Andrew and I's angel investing site. We've got our portfolio there. Um, I need to update it, but it's got most of our investments on there. So you'll see it's pretty broad. Um, we obviously do love B2B SaaS um, just because we can really help on that. Um, we've got a few B2C and D2C. Um, it's really not my area of expertise, uh, e-commerce. Obviously, Design My Night was a marketplace rather than D2C e-commerce. Um, so we've got a few of those, but I sort of shy away from D2C just because, yeah, I, it's, you know, PPC and growth hacking and all of that for it, D2C e-commerce isn't my speciality. And I just know how much money you need to make D2C work, um, especially in today's market. So I'm a bit wary of D2C. Um, I do like marketplaces. Um, I, I ideally want those marketplaces to be SaaS enabled marketplaces. Um, so which is Design My Night. Um, I think if you can find a niche within a market um, and you can build software on the one hand to service the, the B2B side and build a cracking interface on the other for the customers, you can be onto something. Um, so that's really good. I'm pretty broad on the um, types of business. So I don't necessarily have to know the business inside out um, as long as I can understand it. So I, I sort of shy away from like deep tech and stuff like that. Um, I haven't really gone into Web3 yet or metaverse stuff. It's not really crypto, luckily. Uh, it's not none of that's really my vibe. So uh, I sort of stay away from that. Thanks, Nick. A uh, question from Chris. Um, things with Trump, it look like they're off to a great start. But are there things that keep you up at night? Or what would you see as your biggest challenges approaching or your the, the biggest uh, challenges on the horizon? Uh, for Trumpet, yes, I think things have got off to a good start. So we're very positive with Trumpet as definitely, again, like we saw with the software at Design My Night, there is a need for Trumpet. And when salespeople are using it, they're getting results, which is amazing. Um, so that helps a lot. 
Um, I think the big challenge for us is product-led growth. Um, so I'm sure lots of you have heard of PLG, um, so, you know, how Slack grew, how Notion grew, how Figma grew. Um, basically, on the one hand, you need a self-serve product that people can just sign up to, get going with, whether it's freemium or, or not. Um, and then the product does the talking itself. So you have to obviously have great onboarding, um, a great knowledge bank, uh, a simple product to use um, on the one hand. And then the other side um, is you're doing your top down sales. So enterprise sales. So Trumpet, we're already speaking to huge uh, corporates, um, which is great. Um, and that's more of a sales effort rather than a product led growth. So at the moment, we're just really trying to balance the, the top-down sales approach uh, while nailing product-led growth. And product-led growth takes a while to get going. Um, so I think that's what keeps me up, uh, converting free users to paid users. Um, but we're also very early, so uh, it's, it's no need to panic yet. Um, it's my second one, so I'm a lot more chilled. So nothing keeps me up at night necessarily. Um, I'm, I'm a good sleeper, luckily. Um, so yes, it's the, the balance of product-led growth versus top-down sales. Thanks, Nick. Um, question for Alex, from Alex. Um, you raised, you mentioned raising uh, money pre-product. How did you prepare for that? And what were the challenges in pitching an idea and plan only? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so it's obviously much harder pre-product. Um, what I would say though, is if you're pitching pre-revenue, that's a bit easier because they've got no metrics to measure you by. So you can just sell VCs to dream at that point. If you already have revenue and they'll be looking at your revenue lines and if it's not growing insanely that will maybe put investors off so actually for the right early stage investors pre-revenue is a benefit i would say pre-product was a lot harder we had nothing to show them or talk them through um we did pitch with our figma so we had the figma of the product um which was obviously flat on figma but we we walked them through our figma on how the product would look and how it would work um, and that was actually our pitch. We didn't take them through a pitch deck. They, they had our pitch deck, but um, we actually said, look, you've seen our pitch deck. I'm not going to talk you through that and bore you with that. Let us just show you our Figma. It will all come to light then. And as we go, just fire questions at us. And that was a much, much more engaging way than just like boringly taking them through the pitch deck that they've already read. Um, so that worked quite well for us. Obviously, if you're pre-revenue, pre-product, um, your valuation, you have to be aware of your valuation um and uh, the best thing if you're raising is fomo like vcs i don't know if there are any vcs here i apologize uh, are simple beasts like they all have fomo then they don't want to miss out so if you can just get a few nibbles from a few interested parties and you know embellish the truth slightly and just be like oh well look, i we're at quite advanced stages with three others at the moment obviously i can't tell you who they are um, but it's looking very positive. Just little nuggets like that will make them think, oh, okay, we need to get in on this. Um, so it is really crazy how much FOMO drives VCs. And now Trumpet, we've been very uh, outward in our promotion. So we, uh, there's lots of people talking about Trumpet. We're talking about Trumpet a lot at the moment. And it's nuts how the VCs are like crawling all over you because just because there's FOMO out in the world, without even looking under the hood on whether the product's actually doing well or not, they're just getting the FOMO bug already. Um, so if you can build FOMO when you're fundraising, that's probably the most powerful tool you'll have. Thanks, Nick. Uh, another great question from Nadia. You say a lot the products that people want. How are you sure of that, Nick? And how much uh, market research goes into it, or is it gut? Um... That's a good question. So Trumpet, we interviewed 150 salespeople before we even started building the product. Um, so I'm really big on research. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, and again, actually, as an investor, when I see pitch decks of people sort of pre-revenue, I say, OK, if you haven't got revenue. Great. Show me your validation. Like, Who have you spoken to? Have you got any intent of purchase from any uh, potential customers? Like, Show me your research. And they haven't got anything a lot of the time. And then that's just a big no from me, because 
it, it costs you nothing but time to reach out to potential customers on LinkedIn, um, try and get feedback. Um, whenever we get feedback, we give people options. So we'll have a type form or a 15 minute call. Not everyone wants to jump on a call. So I'll be like, look, we're, we're building something in the sales space. I would love either 50 minutes of your time on, on, on the phone, or here's a type form that you can fill out, which will take you five minutes. Um, really appreciate if you can help us with this. And you'll find that a lot of people are happy to help. Um, so that point of view, we did a lot of research and that validated the idea for us. Um, and actually we then built a notion page of all that research and we split it down into the positive, negative ideas and obstacles um and a lot of the ideas we built into the mvp a lot of the obstacles were great for us to challenge ourselves with so it was super helpful um in terms of design my night we uh we were told by this marketing manager of a bar group that we should do it but then we did go and speak so we spoke to a few pub groups we spoke to a bar group we had a one page on what we were thinking of building and we were like if we build this is this something you'd be interested in um so my biggest advice when like pivoting or ideating on a product is, and I say this a lot, but do everything you can to dissuade yourself that it's a good idea. I think it's so easy to come up with an idea, get excited about it. Um, the last thing you should be doing is coming up with a name for it or building a brand. The minute you come up with a name and put a fun logo together, you're in, unfortunately, and you're so excited about it but you need to keep it as like a one pager without any name, any brand, just the idea. Um, and then speak to as many people as you can and just do, do everything you can to prove yourself that it's a terrible idea rather than um, getting people to slap you on the back telling you it's a great idea. Um, and if you go in with that mindset and you can get through that process, um, then you might be onto something. Like those 150 salespeople could have all said, well, this is a terrible idea. We'd never use it, um, which would have been fine. But then we would have known not to spend our time and money building it. Um, so yeah, really do take your time um, before you pivot or, or launch a startup. Thanks, Nick. Um, got a, another question here. How did your approach to price evolve? Price? Yeah um ooh, price so at design my night we close your ears nadia so we looked at book a table open table so our main restaurant competitors and we just sat a bit under them so we sort of undercut them slightly um and we had a lot more functionality um so we could go to the market and say look we do you know five more things than those those bits of kit and we're cheaper so it's sort of like a, a, a why wouldn't you um it's not necessarily always the right way to go is to undercut competitors um i think we did that just to get going and then we sort of pretty much brought it up to parity with the industry um trumpet we're doing the same thing so we're starting cheap so trumpet is 29 pounds a month the license um which is, is nothing. So like when, when, we, when we speak to people and they ask the price and we give them that, they're like, oh, okay. You know, we thought you were gonna say like 80 quid a month. So again, we, we try and just make it a bit of a no brainer, but then you've got to have the confidence to bring the price up. Um, so, you know, everyone that joins Trumpet now will keep them at this low price, but we're already looking at, you know, the results from our users are coming in and it really does work and they're seeing incredible value really quickly. So at 29 quid, it's incredibly cheap. So um, we're keeping it at 29 for now, again, just to get a bit of a groundswell. But then once we've got use cases, uh, test testimonials, we're confident that a product does exactly as we're promising. We, we will bring up the price and then probably have like three or four different price tiers. So uh, I wouldn't say that's the best way to do it. There's loads of different ways. Um, but for us, it was, yeah, start a bit cheaper, get the confidence, but then you've got to, you've got to then bring the price up. You don't want to under, under charge yourself. Thanks, Nick. Um, well, just had a question coming from um, Gareth. You spoke with uh, Dipali Alma uh, previously on Pitch Deck. She's passionate about improving the balance of representation in venture capital to increase access for under 
uh, represented founder communities. What one thing should be done to really move the needle on that? Um, that's a good question. Well, there's a there's a lot of work at the moment in in the v, in the VC world to um, support better underrepresented founders. Uh, like the figures are shocking um, from um, ethnicity, sexuality, sex. Like I still can't believe a female is counted as an underrepresented founder. Like it's it's ridiculous. Um, I think a lot of the BCs that I'm friends with, like they are doing things. So I think on the one hand, the LPs that fund the funds need to be a broader brushstroke, not just older white uh, men, um, which is happening. Um, I think the people they have in the business, again, used to, you know, you'd get on a call with a VC and it was just all older white men. Um, that's definitely changing now as well. Um, so I think that's positive. Um, you know, you you want to feel comfortable when you're pitching a VC. So if you are from an underrepresented, if you are an underrepresented founder, you want to see that represented um, when you're pitching. You so you feel more comfortable. Um, a lot of found, exited founders like myself and ones that are a lot more successful than I have been um, are now angel investing. So I think that's been a cycle that's coming around now, which is great. So there's lots of founders, younger founders who are now angel investing, who are obviously a lot more forward thinking than the older generation um, and setting up syndicates and, and, and vehicles to invest um, where we, you know, we're pooling exited founders together. So I think we're a lot more forward thinking as a generation, which is great. Um, so I think there's, there is a lot happening and I think a lot will change. Um, and there are, I'm sure there are quotas now in VCs and I don't believe in quotas, but look, if they do have quotas and you're underrepresented founder, take advantage of those, that, that quota. Um, and it sickens me to say, but if, you, if you've got your pitch deck and you as founders or your team are underrepresented in one way, make it clear. Obviously, if you're a woman, you just put a picture of yourself on there as a founder. You know, if you're gay, put a little rainbow flag under your bio. Um, you know, take advantage of your uh, underrepresented nature. Um, you really shouldn't have to, but why not? Um, so there, it's definitely more positive, but yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a long, long way to go still. And one final question uh, from Sue: If you haven't got a warm intro, what's the best way to reach out to investors? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so yeah, network is is obviously ideal, but I, I appreciate a lot of first time founders don't have a network as such. Um, the best way to do it. And look, I had a big network when we were raising for Trumpet, but actually two of our investors were from Cold Outreach from us. Um, so Cold Outreach does work. Um, it, it's the way you Cold Outreach is important. So the best Cold Outreach you can do is look who you're pitching to, for starters. Do not just send a generic, hey, this is what we're doing. Be like... Uh, I'll use myself as an example, but in a VC, you find the person you're pitching to and just do a little bit of reading into them. Um, and they'll probably have a bio about themselves on their website. But, you know, don't do this to me because <laughs> I'm not investing as much right now. But if you were pitching me, use this as an example that you would, so you'd be like, hey, Nick, um, looked what you did at Design My Night. Uh, was really inspired by how you pivoted from marketplace uh, to uh, a SaaS enabled marketplace. Um, and I've looked at your portfolio and I can see you've invested in these four other marketplaces. Uh, just wanted to say, you know, we are a marketplace in this industry uh, and we have B2B SaaS element. And then you maybe have like three bullet points. So like 50, you know, 50 customers using the SaaS, 500 people, users on the marketplace, um, generating revenue, you know, if, if, if it's like a grand, generating a grand or looking to generate revenue from next month, here's our deck. Um, so very short, very punchy, but personalized to each person you're pitching to. Um, 
it really does make a difference. Um, and it takes a lot of time raising money, unfortunately. So it's, it's almost like a 90% of your, of your time, probably over a couple of months. So, but it is really worth doing that personalization. It really, really does make a big difference and keep it short. Like if I just open up a message or an email and it's long, I don't even read it just to be, to be honest. And I'm sure you're the same. If someone sends you a huge long email, you go, oh, I can't be able to read that now. So, you know, if someone's pitching me with a long email, I won't even go back to it. I'll just be like, nah, I can't be bothered to read that. Um, so, you know, it, they are looking at hundreds of pitches every month. Um, so short, sweet, let your deck do the talking and personalise it. Thank you very much, Nick. It's been brilliant today and I really do appreciate it. Um, great insight, great story. Um, very much appreciated. And uh, you're going to get some love from the community today i'm sure on linkedin so, some big up and it, anything we can do on the uh, trumpet side let, let us know as a community as well um we'd be very very keen to um help you with that in any any uh way we can um any any last things from the guys nick um i i had one which is uh you've achieved what hopefully we all want to achieve, which is actually exiting a company. So it'd be nice to know when you did exit and then the two years after, because you watch all these films, et cetera, and it's like you going against them for them next two years. How was your two years after you exited? Uh, it is tough. Uh, and I think our investors said, <laughs> you're not going to enjoy it. Um, so it's, it's, we, had, we had very clear revenue targets we had to hit. Uh, um, and you know for us there was quite a bit of money still left on the table for those revenue targets so Andrew and I were very head down driven to hit those revenue targets which 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 is what drove us um, you had a, a sense of relief because you'd already sold it so you were like okay someone has bought the business um, and obviously we got money up front um, but yes it 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 wasn't easy you're 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 sort of you're a, a, a a fun startup suddenly being absorbed into a corporate world. Um, one tip that I've got, it's a legal tip, believe it or not, uh, is our lawyers put this into our contract. Um, there is a clause, and I'm going to bastardize it here, but it's something like the acquirer cannot materially change anything in the business. Yeah. Um, and if they do, they have to pay out the for learn out. So what happened a lot was their leadership team would come to us and say, you guys need to do this, or you need to fire two of your salespeople, or you need to change your revenue model. And we would just go back to them and just be like, clause six, you can't change anything, or we will change it, but you need to pay us the for learn out. So we threw that clause in their face quite a few times. Um, but it, yeah, it's, 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 it, it, it wasn't easy, but because you're coming to the end of the road, uh, that makes it more palatable. A great point, um, Nick. Thank you very much. Anyone else? It's got to be the last question now. And I'll just say, if you want to, <clears throat> anyone on here, if you want to jump the wait list for Trumpet, um, just to... If you're if you have a sales function or you do sales, um, it, you can go to trumpet.app. Um, so it's a separate website, um, and then the secret key is join the band all in all together. Um, so if you go to trumpet.app and put in join the band, that will give you access to Trumpet, uh, and you can sign up. So you can skip the wait list. Um, and everyone that joins get tw gets 20 free, we call them pods, uh, 20 free pods to get going with. So uh, if you want to skip the wait list and just have a play on trumpet, you can do that. Even more value. Thank you very much, Nick. That's uh, been tremendous this morning. And um, as I say, we're, we're going to give you some uh, big ups and some big, lots of love on LinkedIn today. It's been fabulous. You're welcome back anytime, Nick. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And good luck, everyone. Thank you, Nick. Cheers.